Cruising at 33,000 feet, this aircraft is approaching a very critical situation, but the two pilots have no idea. What's soon about to happen will shock not only the crew, but you as well. Stay tuned. Back in August of 2005, a couple of different travel companies had come together to plan a charter flight between Panama and the French Caribbean island of Martinique as part of a package holiday. To operate the flight, they had found a small Colombian charter airline called West Caribbean Airways. And for you to really understand this story, you need to know a little bit more about this company. They started their operation back in 1999 and originally they only operated ATRs and a couple of small LET410 turboprops from Czechia. But in 2003 they also started jet operation using two McDonnell Douglas MD-82s and one MD-81. One of those MD-82s had been acquired from a US-based company and it had spent four years in storage in the Californian desert before being restored to airworthy conditions and imported to Colombia where it would later become involved in this story. Likely because of this, safety standards in the airline had been slipping and the Colombian authorities twice imposed fines for different violations including overloading airplanes, exceeding duty time limits for their crews withholding leave periods and also failing to provide required training to their pilots. But West Caribbean Airways was so short of cash that they couldn't even pay that $45,000 fine imposed by Colombia's Civil Aviation Authority and according to later filed lawsuits, the Colombian CA responded to this not by shutting down the airline as you might expect, but by instead reducing the size of the fine, which seems like a pretty odd thing to do. And things got even worse in March of 2005, when one of the airline's LET 410s crashed on Colombia's Isla de Providencia, killing nine people. After that accident, the CAA placed the airline under even closer observation, but they still allowed them to continue carrying passengers. Now, as so often happens when an airline is on the brink of bankruptcy, the problems just tends to pile on. So a short while later, two of West Caribbean Airways' three MD-80s were grounded indefinitely since they required some heavy maintenance which the airline just couldn't afford. But the passengers from Martinique had of course no idea about the state of the airline when they arrived at Tucumán International Airport in Panama City for their late night flight on August 15, 2005. A total of 152 passengers were booked on the flight and all but one of them were residents of Martinique. In addition to those passengers, there were also eight Colombian crew members on board, including the two pilots. The captain was 40 years old and had 5,942 hours of total flying time and these hours included 1,128 hours flown on the MD-82, which they were now scheduled to operate. The first officer, meanwhile, was just 21 years old, which in some countries is the minimum age to even become an airline pilot, but he already had about one year of experience by that point, with 1,341 total hours, of which 862 had been flown on the MD-82. Now, unfortunately, these pilots were both subjected to quite a bit of background stress as they were getting ready for this flight. And that stress had been caused almost entirely by factors outside of their own control. You see, West Caribbean Airways hadn't paid any of its pilots for a period of six months at this point, due to the financial troubles that they were in. And the crews just kept flying for them for a variety of reasons, including the difficulty of finding a new job, loss of seniority, or fear that they might never get their back pay if they left the company. Now obviously you can't live on thin air, so the captain had been forced to open up a restaurant and a pub, which he ran during his off time in order to make ends meet. And that obviously meant that there was no way that he was getting adequate rest, especially since he was also flying for an airline that had been known to violate duty time limits. But having said that, it should also be mentioned that since two-thirds of the airline's MD-80s were grounded, he wasn't actually flying that much, only 56 hours in the last 90 days, which is quite low by airline standards. Anyway, according to sources, this situation was also causing some tension in his family life, which would have then increased his stress levels even further. And it's also worth mentioning that the composition of this flight crew carried some additional potential risks. The first officer was 
very young, relatively inexperienced and wasn't really the most assertive kind of person. While the captain was twice his age and reportedly had much higher self-confidence. So the first officer would have needed to be explicitly empowered by, for example, crew resource management training in order to effectively make his voice heard. But as we will soon see, the flight deck culture of West Caribbean Airways wasn't providing that kind of environment. Anyway, this charter flight, designated West Caribbean Flight 708, was supposed to leave Panama City at 22.50 local time on August the 15th, so the pilots arrived at the airport well in advance to carry out their pre-flight preparation. Now, we don't have a lot of information about the planning that these pilots did, but they would have reviewed the dispatch documents, checked the technical log for mechanical defects, of which there were none, and calculated how much fuel they would need for the trip. But it later turned out that the company dispatchers had failed to provide weather information in the dispatch paperwork, and the crew, for whatever reason, didn't ask for any updated forecasts, even though there were thunderstorms forecasted along their route. With the fuel needed for the flight, the crew calculated that they would reach a total weight of 148,023 pounds, which was very close to their maximum takeoff weight. But it soon turned out that actually getting that fuel on board the aircraft was not going to be as easy as they might have thought. You see, West Caribbean Airways didn't have enough cash to actually pay for the fuel, so as a result, they had to wait with the refueling until the company had found some way to pay for it, which ended up taking quite a while. By the time the airline had scraped together the cash, the departure time had been pushed back to almost 1 o'clock in the morning on August the 16th, meaning a more than two-hour delay. And this would have also meant that the pilots would now have to fly during the window of circadian low. The window of circadian low occurs during the night and early hours in the morning, when our bodies expect us to be asleep. During that time, our body temperature drops and staying awake during the window of circadian low can result in decreased awareness and severely increased fatigue. This is something that all pilots have to deal with when flying this kind of red-eye schedule and it can be mitigated by making sure that we get good proper rest during the day before the flight. But no matter how much sleep we get, it's hard to avoid getting a little bit drowsy at this time of night, which is worth remembering. Another thing that is worth remembering is the frustration you'll feel every time you're trying to access content just to realize that it's geo-blocked. Maybe you're trying to access an article from a foreign news source or just your favorite video content from home only to be met by that frustrating access denied message. This often happens to my team and I when we are researching videos like this, but with the help of today's sponsor, NordVPN, we can now virtually move to anywhere in the world, which makes things just run much smoother. On top of that, NordVPN also keeps your online activity safe and secure by encrypting your connection, and they offer a whole lot of other cybersecurity tools as well to help keep your online experience as safe and pleasurous as possible. And by the way, let me tell you about a little travel hack that I have found using NordVPN. If you clear your cache and then change your location around when you're trying to book flights, hotels and rental cars, you will soon notice that the same items can vary a lot in price depending on from where you are booking. And this can actually save you quite a bit of money if you try. So, in order to get access to all of this, the only thing that you need to do is to use my link below here, which is nordvpn.com pilot. If you do that, you'll get four months absolutely for free when you sign up for the two-year deal, and it is completely risk-free, since Nord always gives you a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you, Nord. Now, let's continue. Once everyone was boarded and the final checks were complete, the aircraft was pushed back from its gate, and at 58 minutes past midnight, the captain advanced the thrust levels for takeoff, and the aircraft started accelerating down the runway. The takeoff and initial climb were completely normal, all aircraft systems were functioning as they should, and the weather was still quite nice. So, after flying manually for the first few minutes, the captain engaged the autopilot when they climbed through around 9,000 feet. At this point, they were granted an unrestricted climb to their requested cruising altitude, or flight level 310, which is about 31,000 feet. Now, I want to take a moment here to explain a bit about why the crew had chosen this particular cruise altitude, or actually 
how we pilots normally choose our cruising altitudes. Providing that we are doing a normal length flight, we always try to cruise as close as possible to the highest practical altitude. Because the higher we go, the less air resistance we meet, which means that we can get further, faster with the same amount of fuel. But this less dense air also means that the maximum power that our engines can generate decreases. So that fact, together with the decreasing speed of sound at altitude and the maximum differential pressure that the aircraft structure can take, determines the aircraft's service ceiling. Now the MD-82 can theoretically reach as high as 37,000 feet, but only when it's quite light. As the weight of the airplane increases, the maximum altitude decreases, since the engines just won't have enough thrust to maintain both the speed and altitude. And another technical aspect that will soon come to play a really important role in this story is the anti-icing system. The MD-80 has an airframe anti-icing system that heats part of the wings as well as an engine anti-icing system that heats the engine inlets. And both of these systems are used to stop ice buildup from interfering with aerodynamical or thrust sensitive functions of the aircraft. These systems use hot bleed air, siphoned from the engine cores to fulfill their functions, which means that when they are activated, some of the engine's energy is being diverted away from creating thrust. Kind of like how an old bicycle dynamo takes energy away from your bike wheel, but of course much more complicated. Anyway, the main point here is that when the anti-icing system is used, the aircraft has less thrust to work with. So as I mentioned before, with this aircraft's calculated takeoff weight of 148,000 pounds, the maximum altitude after accounting for the fuel burned during the climb would have been only 34,000 feet. But that was if they weren't using any anti-icing. With engine anti-ice on, the maximum altitude would be 32,000 feet, and it would drop to only 31,000 feet with both engine and airframe anti-icing activated. So with a full passenger load and anti-icing on, MD-80 pilots generally know that they'll have to cruise between 29,000 and 31,000 feet, at least for the first part of the flight until they burn off enough fuel to enable further climb. And similar but different restrictions are true for basically all aircraft. So in this case, the pilots had presumably selected a cruising altitude of flight level 310 prior to takeoff because it was the maximum altitude that they could choose if they would need ending or wing anti-ice for some reason. And the pilots probably soon realized that they would likely need anti-ice due to the thunderstorms that they could clearly see further along the route as they were climbing away. But this was not yet an issue. Now, before we get to what happened here, I also want to talk a little bit about how the autopilot and autotrottle work on the MD-80 and how this crew used them during the climb out of Panama. Basically, Every jet type has a very similar set of autopilot and autotrottle modes, although they're called different names by different manufacturers. The autopilot and autotrottle have a mutually dependent relationship that can take on one out of two overarching forms, which we call either speed on pitch or speed on thrust. Speed on pitch means that the autopilot is controlling the speed by modifying the aircraft's pitch angle. In other words, pitching up to slow down or pitching down to speed up. When the autopilot is in a speed on pitch mode, the auto throttle will maintain a constant level of thrust, which is determined by the thrust regime, either automatically set or selected by the crew on the thrust rating panel, like cruise, climb or go around, for example. But speed on thrust means the opposite. The auto throttle constantly modifies engine thrust to control the airspeed, while the autopilot pitches up and down in order to maintain an attitude or vertical speed selected by the crew. Now the final report doesn't say what modes were used during the initial climb to flight level 310, but it would have been standard practice to use a speed on pitch configuration, with the thrust regime just set to climb. That's because this results in the most optimal climb rate for the selected airspeed, and it also protects the aircraft from getting into a low speed situation, since those climb modes would just stop climbing before letting that happen. And also, while I say airspeed, in this case, once they had climbed above 27,000 feet, they would have been controlling the speed using something known as a Mach number, instead of a fixed indicated airspeed. The Mach number is the speed relative to the speed of sound at a given altitude, and since the temperature generally decreases as we climb, the speed of sound also decreases. 
Now when the speed of sound is high, like it is close to the ground, an airliner will reach its maximum structural airspeed before it gets anywhere near the sound barrier, so we generally don't have to worry about Mach numbers down there. But at high altitudes, where the speed of sound is much slower, an airliner might actually start to encounter transonic and possibly even supersonic effects. Now, unless you're in the Concorde, this can be quite dangerous and definitely less efficient. So, in order to avoid that, we use Mach numbers during high altitude climb and cruise. The MD-80, by the way, is happiest cruising at about Mach 0.76, or 76% of the speed of sound, which is just a little bit slower than most other passenger jets. And in the case of this flight, the pilots had selected a cruising speed of Mach 0.75, so between flight level 270 and 310, the autopilot would have started pitching the aircraft to maintain that Mach number, rather than a fixed airspeed. Anyway, with all of that in mind, let's have a look at what was going on in the cockpit as this climb continued. The initial climb worked perfectly fine, so flight 708 finally reached flight level 310 at time 0126. When that happened, the autopilot just leveled the aircraft off and switched over to the altitude hold mode to continue the cruise. Around this time, the pilots must have also noticed that they were approaching an area of thunderstorms, because they now decided to turn the engine anti-ice on. Over the next few minutes, the crew asked the area control center in Barakilla to turn in order to avoid those thunderstorm build-ups, and they were cleared to do so, making a very slight deviation to the left. But then, at time 0139, the pilot suddenly also requested clearance to climb to flight level 330, which was quite a strange thing to do at this point in the flight. You see, they still hadn't burned enough fuel to reach and maintain flight level 330 with the engine anti-ice on, so the fact that the crew still requested this climb could be an indication of some lack of understanding regarding the performance limitations of their airplane. Now, with over 1,000 hours on the MD-80, the captain wasn't new to this type, and even if he was, he should have known that they had departed with close to maximum weight, and therefore he should have been very careful with climbing that high without first consulting their aircraft's performance data. Now, we don't know exactly why the crew took this decision, but it seems likely that they had encountered some turbulence or some other effects of the thunderstorms around them and just decided to try and get above the weather without really thinking too hard about whether that was possible or not. They were still well below the aircraft's maximum certified altitude, so maybe they just underestimated the weight issue. In any case, the air traffic controllers don't know what every aircraft's maximum altitude is, so when the crew requested its new level, the controller just cleared them to climb and maintain flight level 330. Now, in order to be able to climb at a sustainable rate, the crew again selected Climb Trust in the Trust Rating Panel and then switched to a speed on pitch autopilot mode with Mach 0.75 selected. This, again, would ensure that the speed stayed at Mach 0.75, no matter what, while the autopilot pitched to achieve whatever rate of climb that was possible with the available climb thrust, and at first this seemed to work quite well. But after a little more than a minute, the pitch angle required to maintain Mach 0.75 became so low that they almost stopped climbing. Which, as you know, was expected given that they were now close to their trust-limited maximum altitude. Anyway, after flying level for about 20 seconds, at 31,450 feet, the aircraft then started to slowly climb again, but when they reached 32,300 feet, it leveled off once more. At that point, the pilot forced the aircraft to continue climbing using a mode called vertical speed, and they selected 500 feet per minute to do so. But since vertical speed is a speed on thrust mode, and maximum climb thrust was already set, this meant that the speed now started to slowly decrease. The autothrottle soon detected that the speed was below the selected Mach number, even with the engine at the thrust limit, and that caused the autothrottle mode indication to change to Mach altitude, an indication that appears only in this specific situation. But the pilots either didn't see this or disregarded it completely, and they therefore allowed the airplane to continue exchanging speed for altitude, slowly but surely. After about 30 seconds, the captain realized that their speed was decreasing, so he instructed the first officer to turn off engine anti-ice. 
As a result, the aircraft was actually able to reach flight level 330, but its speed had by that point fallen below Mach 0.7. After leveling off, since the anti-ice was now off, the aircraft did also manage to accelerate back up a little bit, but the speed recovery was very slow, even in level flight with the engine still at climb power. As this slow acceleration was taking place, the captain commented that he couldn't get it up to speed. But the pilots didn't discuss why this was the case and they didn't seem overly concerned about it. A thorough deep dive into their performance manuals would have shown them that their aircraft was now flying at the very limit of its performance envelope. But on the other hand, I can kind of understand why these two likely tired pilots didn't spend too much more energy on this, especially since the aircraft was actually accelerating back. The first officer instead now took the opportunity to go to the toilet, and while he was gone, the aircraft was still working on maximum climb thrust for another four minutes before it had finally accelerated back to Mach 0.75. But once it was there, two actions were taken, which would later have major consequences, and both of these actions could have been avoided if the pilots would have understood just how close to the performance limit their aircraft actually was. So what happened then? Well, First, they changed the power setting on the thrust rating panel from climb down to cruise, which was a standard procedure in cruise since we don't normally need to operate the engines at climb power when we're not climbing. But this also meant that the engines would now have a lower thrust limit available to them. Secondly, they turned both the engine anti-ice and airframe anti-ice back on, presumably due to clouds or precipitation nearby, although it's pretty rare to have airframe icing as high up as 33,000 feet. And like I said, switching to cruise power was a routine step that any pilot would have normally done after stabilizing the aircraft at a new flight level, but under these circumstances, the combination of this change with the equally routine activation of anti-ice would now start a chain of events with truly dire consequences. You see, standard operating procedures assume that the aircraft is being operated within the approved flight envelope. But with the anti-ice on, they were now almost 2,000 feet above the maximum altitude for this weight. So, as you might have already guessed, the aircraft now started to slowly decelerate again. But to really understand what was about to happen, we need to talk about something called the power curve. To put things very simple, in order to accelerate an aircraft, the thrust must be greater than the drag. And if thrust is less than the drag, well then the airplane will start to lose speed. There are several things that we can do to increase the drag, including extending flaps or landing gear, but the big one for this story is that drag also increases at higher angles of attack. The angle of attack is the angle between the mean wing cord line and the oncoming airflow, and higher angles of attack cause more drag because the difference of pressure between the underside and upper side of the wing becomes larger, causing more lift and with that more induced drag in the form of vortices by the wing tips. At a constant aircraft weight and altitude, lift is influenced by two main factors, namely the speed and the angle of attack. So if one of these values decreases, the other will have to increase to compensate or else the airplane will start to descend. But what happens when those two influences I just described start working in concert with each other? In other words, what happens if the angle of attack needed to generate enough lift is so high that it causes so much drag that it exceeds the thrust available? Yes the airplane will then start to decelerate, which will cause the lift to decrease, so the only way to prevent the plane from descending would be to raise the angle of attack even more, which will cause even more drag, which will cause the speed to decrease further, which will necessitate an even higher angle of attack. You see the problem? When this happens, we say that the aircraft is falling behind the drag curve, and as you can see, paradoxically, when maintaining altitude under these circumstances, we actually need more thrust in order to fly slower, which sounds totally bonkers, but it is absolutely true. Stay in school, kids. Anyway, this is true up to an optimal speed, where the induced drag and the form drag is as low as possible. Above that optimal speed, the relationship becomes more conventional, meaning that more speed requires more thrust. Now, knowing these optimum speeds is super important for us pilots, because they also give us things like the speed for optimum glide distance, best climb, etc. 
Now you might be able to get back on the correct side of the drag curve by increasing thrust, but at higher altitudes and below a certain speed, the amount of thrust required to stop the deceleration is greater than the available thrust. And when you find yourself there, then you are really in trouble. In that situation, the only way to escape is by descending to a lower altitude, which will cause speed to increase by trading potential energy, altitude, for kinetic energy, speed. But if that doesn't happen, well then the speed will keep decreasing, which will cause the angle of attack to keep increasing, causing further loss of speed, and so on. Until the angle of attack reaches a critical point, where the airflow starts separating from the upper wing surface and the aircraft stalls. So with all of this in mind, let's get back to the cockpit of West Caribbean Airways Flight 708 and see what actually happened. The plane was now at 33,000 feet, which at its current weight was, like I mentioned before, above its service ceiling with empty eyes on. The autopilot pitch mode was set to altitude hold, and in order to maintain this altitude, they needed a relatively high speed and a normal angle of attack. But when the pilots had set the thrust regime to cruise and turn anti ice on, the actual thrust dropped below the thrust required to maintain Mach 0.75, which allowed the speed to start decreasing, putting them further and further back on the power curve. Exactly like I just explained. So beginning at the time 0149, Flight 708 started to continuously lose speed, slowly at first, but then quicker and quicker with every passing minute. The pilots needed to take immediate action to correct the situation by either increasing thrust or descending to a lower altitude, preferably the latter, but none of this happened, which brings us to the final phase of this story. Seemingly unaware of the developing situation, the pilots continued to relax. The meal service was taking place in the back, so the pilots had their food delivered, including a cupcake, which the captain was very happy about. At around the same time, they also switched frequencies from Barranquilla control in Colombia over to Maquitia control in Venezuela, as they were about to cross the border. And the new controller provided an updated routing which the pilots entered. And at some point, the anti-ice was finally turned off. But when that happened, the aircraft had already fallen so far back on the drag curve that that small extra thrust that this provided just wasn't enough. The deceleration just continued. And to make matters even worse, at time 0152, the captain asked whether they had any ice on them, and even though the first officer replied that they did not, they still turned the engine and airframe and the ice back on again. Now, this part wasn't described in the report, but my guess is that this was likely because the captain started noticing that the speed was decreasing, and he likely misinterpreted this deceleration as the consequence of ice, rather than the aerodynamic principle that I explained earlier. This is further corroborated by the fact that they, at this point, also changed back to climb thrust. But again, the only way to get back ahead of the power curve would have been to use both climb power and engine anti-ice and wing anti-ice off. They had to do both of these things, not just one, so the deceleration just continued. By time 0155, they had decelerated to Mach 0.65, and the angle of attack at this point was at 5.8 degrees, which was well above what's normal. At this point, it was pretty likely that they had already passed the point of no return, meaning that they wouldn't have been able to accelerate, even if they firewalled the engines, so the only way out was now to descend. The captain was evidently looking outside because he commented, Ugh, what bad weather, brother. But none of the pilots seemed to be scanning the instruments very closely. When we're in cruise flight with the autopilot on and we're tired in the middle of the night, it can be tempting to take our attention away from what the aircraft is doing. But the MD-80 isn't really forgiving of that kind of complacency. You see, the MD-80's autopilot is not that sophisticated, and it's perfectly happy to keep flying while behind the power curve, just slowly rising the nose until the airplane finally stalls. On many aircraft, the activation of the stick shaker would disengage the autopilot, but not on the MD-80. Instead, its autopilot would actually stay engaged through a stall and will continue to make nose-up inputs until the pilot will manually disengage it. And this had been identified as a possible safety issue after some previous stall incidents involving the MD-80. 
After one of those, back in 2002, Boeing, which had taken over the MD-80 type certificate when they bought McDonnell Douglas, sent out a bulletin to warn all MD-80 operators about this problem, and that included West Caribbean Airways. But there were no evidence that the crew of Flight 708 had ever read that bulletin, so they might not have been fully aware of the importance of monitoring the performance of the autopilot when it was engaged in altitude hold mode, even though I find that slightly unlikely. But it wasn't until time 0157, after decelerating for a full 8 minutes, that one of the pilots must have noticed that something was really wrong. Because at that point, someone manually advanced the thrust level slightly, but it was now way too late. Their speed just kept dropping, and a few seconds later, the first officer finally requested clearance to descend down to flight level 310. By that point, their speed was down to max 0.62, and the angle of attack was at 7.2 degrees. Not fatal, but very high for this phase of flight. On top of that, the horizontal stabilizer had also been continuously trimming backwards in order to keep the altitude with the slowing speed, so now it was approaching full nose up. The captain must by this point have realized that he needed to increase the speed rapidly, so in order to quickly initiate the descent, he now suddenly disconnected the autopilot and took manual control. And for a moment, it seemed like he was about to correct the situation, but he didn't. Disconnecting the autopilot isn't something that we would normally do for a level change during cruise, so it seems odd that he would do this, although given that he hadn't engaged the autopilot on climb mode until they passed 9000 feet, he might just have preferred manual flight, especially when the airplane wasn't performing normally or as he expected it. Anyway, with the autopilot now no longer trying to maintain flight level 330, the airplane started to descend, but the angle of attack was still very high and the speed was very low, so the pilots needed to reduce the angle of attack significantly if they wanted to accelerate. But the captain didn't trim nose down. Instead, he just asked the first officer to give me 310, intending to level off at that altitude, still not understanding the severity of the situation. For about 30 seconds, the captain allowed the aircraft to descend slowly, still losing speed until they reached 31,700 feet, at which point he started pulling the nose up to get ready to level it off. But that maneuver was the last straw. At time 0157 and 44 seconds, as the captain began to pull out of the 2,500 feet per minute descent, the stick shaker activated, warning the crew of an imminent stall. And almost simultaneously, an oral warning also began to call out stall, stall over the cockpit speakers, indicating that the stall had actually already begun. In this case, the warning period was very short because the airplane was also being affected by an updraft associated with a nearby thunderstorm. And that updraft momentarily increased the angle of attack even further, making the warning come earlier than it normally would. Heavy buffeting now started shaking the airplane as the airflow separated from the wings as part of the stall, and as the stall begun, a region of turbulent air from the wake of the stalled wings soon hit the MD-82's two rear-mounted engines, disrupting airflow and causing a sudden decrease in thrust output. Now, despite this sudden chaos, heavy vibrations and blaring alarms, the first officer immediately recognized what was happening and he called out, it's a stall, Cappy, it's a stall. If at that moment either pilots would have pitched down aggressively and started the approach to stall recovery maneuver, it would have been easily possible to recover from this stall, but the captain just didn't react to the first officer's desperate callouts. Instead, he just instructed the first officer to tell ATC that they needed to continue their descent. And even though the first officer knew that they were in a stall and he saw that the captain wasn't applying the correct actions, he just went along with it and asked ATC for clearance down to flight level 290. Now, air traffic control didn't hear that transmission and asked the crew to repeat it, but by this time it was clear that they were going to bust through flight level 290 as well, so the first officer asked for flight level 240 instead. Now, this set off all kinds of alarm bells for the controller, who asked if they had any problems on board. And in response, the captain said to the first officer, Tell him we have two engine flame out. And this statement gives us a little picture of what was possibly going on inside the captain's head, since his actions might be quite difficult to understand. 
When the stall had first started, the engine thrust on both engines had also decreased due to the disrupted airflow. And it appears as though the captain had noticed this indication, and when he saw the loss of thrust, he may have developed a belief that he was dealing with engine problems, at which point his attention started to tunnel in on the engine indications, at the expense of all other information. The MD-80's stall warning systems are pretty comprehensive. It has a stick shaker, an oral stall alarm, as well as flashing warning lights, but it is possible that by the time that these warnings went off, the captain's brain was already saturated with stressors and just tuned out those alarms as well as the first officer's calls. I like to think of our human stress capacity as a pitcher of water, where we keep functioning normally even as stress factors slowly start to fill the pitcher up. But only until the water reaches the top and then starts spilling everywhere. We know that the captain was under a lot of background stress before this flight even took off due to the dire state of the airline, six months without pay, troubles at home and so on. And then during this flight, the plane wouldn't accelerate, they were surrounded by bad weather, he was tired and then suddenly it seemed like both of his engines were failing. And this, plus his already almost full stress picture, might have been enough to just push him over the edge. Afflicted by tunnel vision, he likely started tuning out obvious signs that they were in a stall, including all of the warnings from the aircraft and the first officer's callouts. And having made the assumption that his engines had lost power, the fact that they were descending wouldn't have surprised him, because of course the airplane would descend if the engines aren't producing enough power. But at the same time, the captain also continued to pull back on his control column, deflecting the elevators to almost full nose up, which was wildly inappropriate, regardless of whether they were in a stall or had a dual engine failure. It's really difficult to understand why he would do this, but my best guess is that this was an unconscious panic reaction while under extreme stress, and he might not have been even fully aware that he was doing it. Now, some of you might ask, if he was so stressed, how come he had the capacity to tell the first officer to ask for lower altitudes as they were falling? And the answer to that is likely as strange as it is real. You see, when subjected to extreme stress, humans will react in wildly different ways. Some will completely freeze up, others will continue to work at reduced capacity, and some will revert to a state where some actions will be completed seemingly in a normal way, but the person will be effectively running on a sort of autopilot, where active decision making has effectively stopped. This is sometimes known as subtle incapacitation, and we will never know for sure if this was what had happened here, but we do know that the captain's actions had moved away from the golden rule of aviate, navigate, communicate, and had stopped making any type of sense. On top of that, we have the young, unassertive first officer, who allowed himself to become an extension of the captain's tunnel vision, instead of taking action to respond to an emergency that he had correctly identified. This is why crew resource training and the emphasis on assertiveness, especially from first officers, is so important. By the time the crew reported the perceived dual engine failure, the airplane was in a full-blown stall, with the rate of descent passing 7,000 feet per minute. Air traffic control cleared them to descend at pilot's discretion, at which point the captain told the first officer to ask for the minimum en route altitude. Now, clearly, he was worried about flying too low and striking terrain, which was of course important, but the fact that this seemed to be his top priority rather than pitching down and get his aircraft flying again just shows how little of the situation that he was understanding. With the aircraft soon descending with over 12,000 feet per minute, air traffic control repeatedly asked for the flight's distance from various waypoints, but the first officer just replied, negative, negative. By this point, the descent rate was so high and their altitude so relatively low that it was likely impossible to recover, even if the correct actions of lowering the nose would have been taken. But now, someone at least disconnected the outer throttle and managed to increase the thrust on both engines. But with the captain still pulling back on his controls, this had no effect. They just kept falling faster and faster. The captain soon called out, uh, we're at 14,000 feet and going down, the airplane is uncontrollable. And the first officer reported this to ATC, who asked for the number of people on board and their intentions. Uh, 152, the airplane is uncontrollable, the first officer replied. And this was the last thing that was ever heard from the crew. <laughs> 
It's impossible to even imagine the desperation they must have felt as they plummeted through the darkness with the ground rapidly coming up towards them. And in the back of the aircraft, it's unlikely that anyone had any idea of what was going on. No PA had been given and there had been no communication with the cabin crew, so people probably just thought that the aircraft was flying through some rough turbulence. During the very last few seconds of the flight, the ground proximity warning system called out, sink rate, whoop whoop, pull up. But then it was all over, as flight 708 impacted a field in a rural area of western Venezuela with a nose high attitude and a descent rate of over 12,000 feet per minute. The impact completely destroyed the aircraft and all 160 souls on board were instantly lost. The investigation into what ended up being the worst air disaster in the history of Venezuela determined that the causes of the crash were the flight crew's lack of situational awareness during a prolonged loss of airspeed and a breakdown in crew communication that prevented them from recovering from the stall. Also, the immediate conditions for the accident were created by the pilot's decision to climb to a flight level that was outside of the performance envelope of their aircraft. In some respects, this accident mirrored other high-altitude stall accidents which had happened in the 2000s and early 2010s, like Air France 447. And it also highlighted a lack of training on this type of emergencies in airlines all over the world. One really important thing that the investigators noted was that neither pilot had been trained to recover from a high-altitude stall, where immediately unloading the winds by pitching down is absolutely crucial. This is compared to a low-altitude stall, where it can be possible to power out of the stall using only engine thrust, and where stall training in some instances had been focused on minimizing the amount of altitude loss, instead of focusing on pitching down to unload the wings. This led to more focus on this type of training all over the world, but there is no way that we can explain this accident without also pointing out the role of the airline, West Caribbean Airways. Their hopeless financial situation had put undue stress on their crews, and as it later turned out, they really shouldn't have been operating at all. According to lawsuits filed after the crash, West Caribbean Airways' mandatory insurance had lapsed in July of 2005, one month before the crash, and had never been renewed. The day after the crash, West Caribbean Airways and its one remaining airworthy airplane were grounded indefinitely, never to fly again. But by then, it was obviously too late. The time for regulators to take action is before lives are lost. And if there is one lesson that should be learned from this horrible accident, I hope that that is the one. Now, check out these other videos next. And if you want to support the mission of this channel, which is to inform, educate and drive aviation safety forward, please join my Patreon crew using the link here below, which is patreon.com slash join slash mentor pilot. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.